Good afternoon. We're going to get started here. Um, first of all, welcome um, to our Ohana Center of Excellence webinar. Um, we're very excited to have our very special presenter today, um, Dr. Michael, Dr. Michael Lau, um, Liao. And what's really important for us is that this is a webinar that is part of a series of webinars from the Center of Excellence. We appreciate your pre-registering and you can let your friends know um, to link in, you can share the link. I want to begin um, by letting you know that um, we want you to, if you can, um, participate in our pre-survey if you didn't get a chance to do it already um, before uh, the webinar started. Um, but it's really important that you also complete the post-survey. We're part of a federally funded um, project from SAMHSA. Um, and we're really, it's really important for us to be able to um, evaluate and assess the participation in our webinars. So without um, going much further, I want to make sure that we leave a lot of time um, for Michael Liao to present today. Um, this is a very important topic on um, culturally and linguistically appropriate services. And I'm gonna share a really quick bio on, on Michael Liao. Michael Liao's career in social work has spanned various settings, including child welfare, domestic violence prevention, supervised visitation, mental health, and substance abuse treatment. Michael is currently the director of programs for NICO's Chinese Health Coalition, since 2004, Michael has been providing cultural responsiveness training on a wide range of topics, including implicit bias um, and widening our personal lens, cross-cultural communications, Asian American cultural issues, LGBTQ plus issues, and anti-oppressive practices for a wide variety of audiences. So that's a very a lot to unpack in the short time that we have with him. Really appreciate his expertise. Um, again, I want to welcome um, Michael Liao. And so now we're um, I'm going to stop sharing and we're going to switch over to the slide deck um, that Michael Liao has. So thank you and welcome today. Um, again, my name is Kathleen Wong Lao. I am a co PI on the SAMHSA grant for the Ohana Center. Um, and also um, one of the facilitators um, for our Ohana team. Thank you, Thank Mike. You. Thank you so much, Dr. Wang Lao. Um, I'm going to share screen now. Hopefully everyone can hear me okay. So good afternoon to everyone. Um, oops. Uh, go right to the beginning. So um, I wish I could see everyone, um, but this is also the beauty of webinars where we could bring folks from uh, all over, um, you know, together in one space. So I'm happy to be sharing this space with you today. So before we begin, um, I would like to uh, make sure that we do a, a land acknowledgement. So Nikos is located in San Francisco. We do acknowledge that um, the location where we are uh, broadcasting this webinar is on the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramitush um, Ohlone, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. As the indigenous stewards of this land and in accordance with their traditions, the Ramatush Ohlone has never exceeded, lost, nor forgotten their responsibilities as the caretakers of this place, as well as for all the people who reside in their traditional territory. So all of us as guests, we recognize that we benefit from living and working on their traditional homeland. And we wish to pay our respects by acknowledging the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramatush community by affirming their sovereign rights as first people. So I also wanted to give a quick introduction uh, for myself. I, I know that Dr. Wang Lao already shared my quick bio, but um, you know I, I've been working in some type of um, social service and behavioral health field for a long time. Um, one of my first jobs after graduating from San Jose State, which is also a partner uh, in the Ohana Center of Excellence, um, was to work as a um, substance abuse counselor um, paraprofessional at an agency uh, called Asian Americans for Community Involvement in San Jose. So I did that for a while. Later at um, Nikos, which is my current workplace, I also had several, um, uh, over a decade, almost two decades of experience working with um, issues like gambling addiction and more recently with gaming and screen use related issues. So um, I hope to be able to bring some of that, those uh, type of experience to um, my presentation today as well. So this is uh, the storefront uh, of the organization that I'm representing today. 
So I am with Nico's Chinese Health Coalition. I'm also joined by my colleague, Allison, who is assisting me with um, posting some resources and materials in the chat. So thank you so much, Allison. So Nico's Chinese Health Coalition is a very small nonprofit in San Francisco's Chinatown. A lot of folks often wonder, what, what does Nico's mean? And it's actually the first letters of our five founding organizations that came together to create this coalition back in 1985. These organizations were some of the largest organizations serving Chinese and Asian Americans. And they recognized that rather than engaging in all of these parallel advocacy work to make systemic changes, that it may be more impactful and effective to have a single voice for Chinese American health issues. And that's how Nikos is born. We are not a direct service clinic. We're not a direct social service organization, but rather we engage in research, data collection, advocacy, training and education, and coalition building. Uh, really quickly running through the um, agenda for today, would love to start with some basic discussions about culture so that we have a common understanding of what is culture, what is identity, and why is it important for us to think about in delivering behavioral health care. Also, we'll briefly touch on um, issues related to Asian American community, some statistics, but primarily focus on what are some of the behavioral health challenges and um, areas uh, and issues. Uh, the main uh, part of the presentation will focus on the application of the national class standards as a framework for providing culturally responsive care for Asian American community. And throughout the presentation, I would also love to ask all of you to maybe engage in some self-assessment whether it is for yourself as a private pr uh, practitioner, pr a provider, or as uh, part of a larger organization in terms of how well your organization may be meeting the challenge of implementing class standards. So hopefully all of that sounds okay. I had hoped that I could see um, your chat responses, but um, you know, if, if you do have any questions or concerns, please feel free to put them in the Q and A, and I'll let Dr. Wang Lao stop us at any point. Um, you know, maybe we'll do some check-ins throughout the presentations to see if there are any burning questions that we should address before the end. But we'll also leave time at the end for Q and A. All right, so let's begin with um, a discussion about culture and identity. I would very much love for you all to um, think through a couple of questions. But before we do that, um, could I maybe ask Allison to drop our POEF link in the chat? Um, this may be a little unconventional, but I would love, um, and, and um, Allison, if you start with the HTTP, it'll be clickable. Um, if you all would check out this link, which is like Kahoot, if, if you're familiar with Kahoot. Um, it allows us to administer polls, and we'll use this throughout the presentation to get you to uh, be able to share some of your thoughts. So if you could either scan the QR code or click the link that Allison uh, just helped me put in the chat. Thank you so much. Um, yes, it's definitely clickable now. Um, we could begin with some of our questions, okay? So again, poef.com slash Nikos, N-I-C-O-S. And a couple of questions I wanted to ask. First one is if you could help me think through what is culture, okay? So you could, uh, once you get on the website, you could use a nickname and then you could just start um, um, answering questions. So the first question I would love um, for you to be able to think through is what is culture? What are some elements that make up a person's cultural identity? If you think about what makes up, what are components that make up a person's culture and cultural identity? What are some of those components that are most important, you think? And hopefully it's not too challenging to use POEV. Um, I'll wait a little bit. So I see, thank you so much. One response coming in, there are social practices um, uh, uh, so behaviors and practices that help communities to come together. And it's also partly a celebration um, of, you know, those commonalities that they share, right? 
It can be a way of living life and how we interpret the world, how we make sense of the world around us. I love that. Thank you so much. Are there other elements of um, cultural uh, identity that folks wanted to share? Parts of family, friends, and community that include religion, food, education, and celebration. That's wonderful, right? So there's a lot of, um, I see some trends about social connection, um, shared common practices, and also uh, beliefs and values and how we see the world. And I think there are also a lot of other things that maybe are more visible as well, right? Things like clothing, like food, like language, like how we carry ourselves through the world, right? So let's, uh, for the sake of time, move on to another question. Um, if you wouldn't mind sharing, what are some sources of culture that are important to you? Like, where did you gain your sense of cultural identity? What are some places or people where you were able to adopt or learn about or gain elements of cultural identity? What are important sources? I do uh, acknowledge that often it takes a while to type out sentences, maybe easier to say it out loud. So I, I, I do apologize about that challenge, um, but would be lovely to hear uh, from, from uh, hear some of your thoughts. So I do see um, about some, some patterns about how we were brought up, our upbringing, the people that raised us, right? our schools, our communities, religious organizations, social gatherings. Yeah, thank you so much. Parents, families, and it could be chosen communities and families as well, not necessarily biological. And the people that we are friends with, our peers, thank you so much. Really appreciate your participation. Please feel free to keep it coming. Um, and I, I can uh, share some of these with folks after. So I really want to highlight that often when folks think about culture, we tend to think it's synonymous with the list on the left, right? A lot of these identity and social forces like race, gender, age, uh, religion, right? We often associate these with culture. Um, but I think oftentimes there are also other aspects of shared experience that could forge a sense of connectedness, right? A sense of shared values and shared practices. So for example, geographic location, right? Where we grew up, the neighborhood that we lived in, even the block that I lived on could have a drastically different culture versus another block close by. Or it could be similar shared experiences of oppression, right? So folks who may come from different national backgrounds or ethnicity or even speak different languages, but maybe find a strong sense of connection through shared experience of being refugees, being HIV positive, domestic violence survivors, or people who are both in recovery from an addictive disorder, right? That often could even drive greater connectiveness and a sense of cultural um, identity um, as uh, that could be as powerful, if not more so, than some of those that we tend to think of as synonymous as culture. So moving forward, I really wanted to just say that obviously in our line of work, we often have to reduce our clients to check boxes on forms for, for part of funding or bureaucracy, but culture is more than just check boxes on a form, right? We're always more than the sum of our parts. And so I really like this model by Hofstede, who is a Dutch social psychologist, who really frames this idea of culture as part of mental programming, not unlike how we program computers or laptops, right? Our smart devices, our laptops come with pre-installed operating systems so too do we as humans come with pre-wired something universal that we all share, no matter what background we come from, right? Or where we were born or when we were born. We have a common universal human nature of feeling the need to be loved, the need to feel safe, the need for connections. 
And then the layer on top of that is culture, is learned behavior that we pick up, the traditions, the values, the beliefs that we all pick up from those around us, like you all mentioned, right? From our loved ones, our peers, from pop culture, right? From music. Um, and that could be group specific or category specific. But then also we must remember that even two people who look like they may come from the same culture, they don't all share exactly the same cultural identities. And that's because of personality, right? Which can both be inherited or learned. So there's individual um, idiosyncratic nuance, right? So I really like to use this as kind of a... Um, um, an approach when I think about how do we work effectively with people. In one, on one hand, we always should remember that there's a human connective, um, universal connection that we could make with any client using universal empathy, building rapport. We are able to make connections with any client in front of us. But at the same time, we also have to remember that we have blind spots, things that we may not know because we have different cultural conditioning versus another person. We may have installed different apps and programs throughout our lives to understand the world versus the client in front of us. But yet at the same time, it's also important for us to know that just because we could learn as much as we can about a particular culture, or national background or um, gender identity or sexual orientation, that it doesn't mean we know how every person who comes from that cultural group is gonna behave or is going to act, right? It's because we also have to recognize that each person is ultimately an individual as well. So I hope that's helpful. Um, oops, moving forward. Uh, I really love this quote. I am large. I contain multitude. So all of us are intersectional. And at any one time, we're more than just a two, three identities that people might be able to see visibly or be able to or or, you know, um, that they might associate us with because of assumptions. But we're always more than that. Um, and this one, I think uh, I'll, I'll just kind of, um, for the purpose of time, I'll just kind of, um, you know, expand on this myself. What, what purpose does culture serve? Why is this important? Why does it matter, right? Why do we have training upon training to um, talk about cultural differences and, um, and issues like, like that? And I think partly is because we recognize that culture in a way it's kind of a blueprint, isn't it, for us on how to behave in different social situations. It tells us what's good and what's bad. It tells us um, how we should act and how we should ask for help, right? So in that way, I think we all can agree that culture can shape how we think, feel, and act as it relates to health, mental health, and how we strive for wellness. It could also um, uh, shape how we walk through life and how we experience systems, including the healthcare system or behavioral systems of care, right? It could determine how accessible healthcare is to us. Unfortunately, in this um, world, we also see that it also can determine how well we uh, is uh, how how good our health outcomes are when we go through the healthcare system and the quality of oh, quality of care that we receive. Finally, culture can often be a resource and and be help us on our roads to recovery, but at times it could also be a barrier um, for clients in seeking help. And culture can shape what um, help seeking looks like what recovery looks like. It could shape how, how involved the family is. It could even shape how, how that, that family, quote unquote, looks like, right? Someone mentioned earlier that it can often be family of choice, especially when we work with um, our LGBTQ plus populations, right? It could um, influence treatment preference and how 
um, likely the client is to adhere to a treatment plan, for example. So um, I'm going to go through this section very quickly just because I want to make sure we have enough time to um, tackle class. Um, all of this is probably um, refresher for all of us who work with Asian American communities day in and day out. But we know that Asian Americans is one of the fastest growing groups in, uh, in the US. We also know that Asian Americans are spread out throughout the country, but um, that there are some states like California, New York, and Hawaii, where we have um, larger numbers of Asian Americans residing. Asian Americans also have um, a wide range of countries of origin and lineage. And related to that also have a broad um, number of languages and dialects that are spoken, right? From even just one single country in China may have many, many different um, Chinese languages and dialects and regional differences, as well as countries like India. Um, and you know why does this matter? Why does this matter is that we also disproportionately have larger proportions of folks who are limited English speaking, or according to the census, speak English less than very well. So within Asian American community, that's nearly a third of our population are limited English speaking, compared to just eight percent of the total or general population. So all of that creates challenges and unique situations for accessing behavioral health care. So let's talk about some of the mental and behavioral health care concerns for Asian Americans. We know that disparities exist, and we know that unfortunately our systems of care are not colorblind, are not gender blind, are not age blind, and, and so forth, right? That at least in part, biases, stereotyping, and prejudices on the part of providers can further contribute to some of these disparities in healthcare. And that these disparities are a reflection of the deeper and broader historic um, you know, inequities in our society. So I'm going to make a few statements um, that relate to how Asian Americans um, you know, the unique uh, challenges related to mental health for Asian Americans. I think often when we use Western conceptions or mainstream conceptions of mental health and wellness, how we talk about mental health, what that looks like, what being, what experiencing mental illness looks like or wellness uh, within the context of Western uh, conceptions, often may render mental health issues invisible um, within Asian American communities and can lead to miss or under diagnosis, right? So we know, for example, that many Chinese and Asian American clients are more likely to express mental distress through physical manifestations or expressions, right? Somatization refers to that. Um, for example, a study that was conducted in Hong Kong where they surveyed um, Chinese patients who came into the primary health clinic and they used a standardized uh, depression screen. For the patients that were screened, um, um, uh, that, that were screened to be probably depressed, um, the most common symptoms that they checked off were somatic symptoms like I've been feeling tired and fatigued. I've been experiencing pains and aches. I've been having stomach issues or heart issues. Um, and none of them initially exhibit uh, came in to the clinic for feeling dysphoric, right? For dysphoric um, feelings or, or mood states, um, but rather exhibited or came in for, you know, um, the, the more somatic expressions like the physical issues. And so if we used the more traditional methods of asking questions about uh, mental health by asking if folks you know, feel sad or feel lonely or feel hopeless, and we may in fact be missing a lot of potential um, depressive symptoms among clients who may not express or present in the more conventional ways, right? 
And in the study, when trained clinicians uh, used culturally responsive methods to ask um, about mood states, most of these folks who uh, depressed patients were able to articulate that they've been losing more interest in things that they were interested in, that they were feeling more, um, you know, um, 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 sad. And so it's not that they weren't able to articulate that, but the fact is that most of the times in terms of expression, um, that could look different. Statement two, Asian Americans aren't monolithic and groups differ in terms of behavioral health issues. So often this is one of the reasons why Nikos is such a strong advocate on local and state levels for the disaggregation of Asian American data. So overall drug and alcohol use um, data often depicts Asian Americans as um, using less than the general population. But those rates actually vary widely within Asian American subgroups and by drug type. For example, in comparison of alcohol consumption, studies have shown Japanese and Korean Americans to have higher alcohol consumption rates compared to, for example, Filipino, Chinese, and Vietnamese um, Ameri uh, uh, community members. Among um, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders, we also see significantly higher rates of stimulant use where in some studies, they actually have some of the highest rates of stimulant use and misuse compared to any other ethnic group. Among Asian adults, we also see differences by acculturation where those born in the US tend to have significantly higher rates of drug use compared to those who are foreign born. And when we see issues re related to gambling, which is another issue that disproportionately impacts Asian Americans, we kind of see a different trend. So studies have pointed to higher rates of problematic and addicted gambling among many Asian American populations. And specifically within the Asian American population, we've seen groups such as Southeast Asian refugees and asylum seekers in one study um, were found to have particularly uh, high rates of um, problematic gambling potentially related to trauma and other environmental factors, such as not having um, in, uh, adequate alternative uh, in-language recreations, where casinos become default community centers in many parts of the country, where they provide in-language uh, service, right? Um, unlike the trend for substance use and abuse, we see that among within problem gambling, among Asian Americans, those who are immigrants tend to have higher risk for developing gambling related issues. Statement number three, the lack of linguistically and culturally competent behavioral health workforce contribute to barriers for Asian Americans to access behavioral health care. So we know that among our behavioral health workforce, Asian Americans still um, you know, are underrepresented within most of the major um, categories like addiction counselors, psychologists, social workers were typically um, a little bit better in terms of parity, um, but still um, there's a lot of more work needed to be done. Last and final st statement that a lot of stigma within the Asian American community also um, contribute to creating additional barriers for talking about or seeking help for mental health. So I won't go through all of these. Um, the slide deck um, in the Google Doc that Allison shared is already in there. There's a PDF version of the slide deck. So some of the information that you feel like I went over too quickly, you could also still um, access after. So obviously we know there are a lot of stigmas and um, maybe um, you know, avoidance of expressing emotions within many of the communities that we work with or concerns about airing dirty laundry. But there are also a lot of systemic barriers of people who genuinely have experience um, or have genuinely have had bad experience with the behavioral health providers or systems where they have a mistrust of systems, uh, concerns that accessing certain mental health services may um, impact them negatively in other areas of life. 
um, or perceived or actual discrimination within those systems of care. So we see from data, for example, from UCLA, uh, the California Health Interview Survey, that Asian Americans as a group has one of the highest rates of actually feeling like they needed mental, emotional, or substance-related help in the past year, but not seeking or receiving treatment. And so all of this is really to say that the, the behavioral health system really needs to do better to provide accessible and, and effective care for our Asian American communities. And that's where the national class standards comes in. So I really hope to make this engaging. We do plan to use POEF again. So I hope you haven't closed out that tab. If you have, we'll put the link in the chat again. But if you could continue to use POEF for the remainder of this presentation, I would love to um, make this an interactive activity where we'll do a competition quiz game just for fun, okay? Um, but we'll we'll do a quiz game called Classes in Section uh, in Session. And Allison, if you could post the POEF um, link again, that'd be really great. So this is where we'll ask some questions about class before I share the answers. Thank you so much, Allison. Um, the more the quicker you respond, the more points you get. But of course, you have to make sure that you try to get the correct answer as well. Okay, so let's go through all of these um, and see, um, you know, um, how well we can do. So the NICO's Class Act program, which is the project where I'm able to go out and do consultations and trainings for organizations, is so named after the national class standards, which were, uh, were created by uh, the U.S. Office of Minority Health under the Department of Human, uh, Health and Human Services. What does CLASS stand for? So is it competent language access for services, community leadership, advancement and safety, or culturally and linguistically appropriate services? I'm not sure if I could see how many votes have come in. I don't see that. So I'm going to give folks just a few moments for the sake of time, and I'm, I'm going to move forward, okay? So I'm going to move forward in about three, two, one. All right, so great. We all did really great. So class standards, um, class refers to culturally and linguistically appropriate services. So the national class standards were originally and... Uh, <laughs> These are this is the leaderboard. So we'll we'll keep going. We'll we'll see how it changed and shifts throughout. So great job. So the national class standards were originally uh, published in 1999, and more recently in uh, 2013, the revision was released. So between 2010 and 2012, the Office of Minority Health went through the enhanced class standards initiative in order to address a few things. It was because of the recognition that the country was rapidly diversifying and there was a need to update the standards um, to continue to keep them relevant. And also in the a little bit more than a decade since the original standards came out, there were a lot of advancements in the field of cultural competency. And finally, also to ensure that the class standards continue to have relevance to align with um, national policies that were being implemented. Implemented. So at that time, the revisions looked at culture as more than just race and ethnicity. It had a more inclusive definition of health and also added standards on leadership. So let's move forward. Let's do one more really quick quiz. So what major national policy played an instrumental role in initiating the enhancement of the national class standards? And there's a timer there, but we're not going to wait 25 seconds just for sake of time. We're going to move forward in maybe three more seconds. Okay, so three, two, one, let's move forward. Sorry for the, yeah, I, we just want to make sure we cover enough um, content. 
So wonderful. So the Affordable Care Act um, around that time of the enhancement, which was between 2010 and 2012. And so partly it was also to ensure that important national legislation and policies like the ACA, um, you know, is being considered and, and how the class standards can uh, play a, a, um, a stronger role uh, with these implementations. Oops. All right, so we're, we're gonna keep moving forward. MS is doing great, um, whoever that is. So the national class standards, there are 15 total class standards. 14 of them fall within three main themes, and I'll explain why that is. So the three main themes are governance, leadership, and workforce. The second theme is communication and language assistance. The third and final theme is engagement, improvement, and accountability. So let's go through this. So in the national enhanced national class standards, the first standard has now been transformed into the principal standard. So can you all share which of the following statement is true about the principal standard? Is it that it frames the intent and goals of the entire set of 15 standards? Is it the first standard that must be achieved before one can begin to work on the other standards? It, is it the only standard that must be achieved, whereas the rest are merely suggestions and guidelines? Or if all the other 14 standards are adopted, implemented, and maintained, the principal standard will be achieved. So let's move forward. And you all did great. There are actually two correct answers in this case. So one in that it frames the intent and goals. And also the purpose is that if the other standards are adopted and regularly maintained, that um, it is assumed that the principal standard is achieved, okay? So let's really look quickly look at the principal standard. So the principal standard states that we as providers must provide effective, equitable, understandable, and respectful quality healthcare that are responsive to diverse cultural beliefs, practices, preferences, preferred language, literacy, and other communication needs. So in essence, it really says that no matter who the client is, no matter what language they speak, no matter what background they come with, that they should be able to go through your doors and go through your system of care and come out with the same opportunities to thrive as anybody else, right? that they should all have an equitable chance to thrive. So, um, you know, that's the principal standard that, that sets the tone. And now moving into the first theme, which is governance, leadership, and workforce, there are three standards within this. And we'll share, I may share some examples as we go. So standard two says that there should be um, support from the very top down, uh, of the organization, if it has the, a, a hierarchical structure, that it has support of the governance and leadership to promote class through everything the organization does, including policy practices and resources that it allocates or personnel that it allocates towards um, class-related initiatives. Not only that, it also says in standard three, that every person within the organization, whether it be someone who is the front facing person, that is the first person that greets the clients, the staff that provides direct services, the um, leadership, the board of directors, they should reflect the intended audience, the people, the population that the organization purportedly serves, right? Do they look like, do they sound like, do they um, you know, have similar values and life experiences as the people that the organization says they serve? So, you know, again, kind of looking at the statistics here, we kind of see that in all of our areas of, of service providers, that we're still kind of straggling behind in terms of recruiting folks of color into our workforce, right? So some of the strategies that Nikos has used over our decades of existence include upstream strategies like building workforce pipelines, getting middle school, high school students connected in volunteer and internship programs with Nikos um, coalition members so that we could 
hopefully inspire the next generation of bilingual bicultural workforce to get young people interested in working in health. We could partner with local colleges and universities to bring in bilingual bicultural interns. That's often how many of our staff come to be there. Uh, both Allison and I were former interns. Advertise positions in local ethnic media or newspapers. And of course, it's important to have organizational support as well for these bilingual staff, such as financial incentives, hiring bonuses for bilingual folks, and to have leadership and mentorship programs um, in order to ensure that not only is important for you to bring on the bilingual folks, that you support them and help them um, advance within the organization. Uh, standard four, the last one within this section, also says that we must provide ongoing education and training for all levels of staffing and personnel within your organization related to class. So I really would love for folks to kind of reflect on some of these questions. You don't have to uh, answer them out loud, but how well do you think your organization, department, or practice, um, you know, how well do the staff represent the community it serves? And what are some strategies you think your organizations can adopt to uh, increase diversity, to ensure that your staffing more accurately reflects the people that it serves? Do you receive ongoing training about culture and diversity and class? If so, what kind? And how effective do you think they are? So if you could think about some of these questions as we go, um, you know, th these are really for you to self-reflect. So let's move on to the second um, theme, which uh, for those who are receiving federal uh, funding, this often is the mandate, right? The uh, While the other um, class standards are, um, you know, suggested and recommended, these are the mandates. So these are relating to language assistance. So standard five says that we must offer at no cost to our clients language assistance so that our clients, no matter what language they speak or their communication preference or ability, they can have timely access to the needed care that they, they need. So let's really quickly do one more pop quiz. Can you select the statement that is true about threshold languages? What are threshold languages? And there are four options here. Is it the official language of a given region? Is language spoken by 3,000 people or 5% of the population? Or language voted on by voters in a geographic location? So I'm going to move forward just for sake of time, okay? So this, uh, there are, again, two possible uh, correct answers. It's either 3,000 or 5% of the population, whichever is lower typically. And at times, um, it might not be the general population that a particular region uses. It may be the population that is Medicaid, Medi-Cal eligible in California is Medi-Cal. Um, and so often this is the way to determine the threshold or most common languages in a specific geographic location. So, um, you know, we also have a tool here that I'll let you look a little bit more closely on your own, but there are also some examples of how to decide between face-to-face -face versus telephonic. And in general, the more difficult, challenging, um, and, and the sensitivity of the topic and subject matter often necessitates more face-to-face, -face, right? Um, especially if you're working with more traditional clients. So um, we'll, we'll sh this is in the slide deck that, that you can access as well. Um, we also wanted to call out some language access success stories in San Francisco Bay Area. Asian Women Shelter, one of our partners, has an MLAM program, which is multilingual access model, where between seven partner organizations that are focused on anti-violence work, they recruit and train bilingual bicultural women from underserved and under unserved communities to become paid advocates and they share this pool of multilingual advocates between those seven organizations. And this has been touted as a national model for delivering in um, language access. Um, I'm seeing that we're running a little low on time, so I'm gonna keep moving forward. Uh, Sanders Six says that not only do, do we need to provide language assistance, we have to tell people about it. So there has to be signage, 
both in uh, written, but also verbally to let folks know that language assistance is available. So tools like this, which we provide to clients, uh, which is an I speak card to let uh, clients put these in their wallets. They could bring them to different organizations to show that they do have a right to language access and to indicate what language they speak. For us, we indicate the most common Chinese dialects that are spoken by our clients. Other tools could include a language card for uh, clients at a reception's desk to point to the language that they speak. But also keep in mind client literacy levels uh, because this requires a client to be able to read uh, in their native language. And that may not be the case for every client that you come across. Um, so th there can be additional challenges. So it's always good to have some verbal backup option if you're using tools like these. Uh, this one is easy, true or false. I mean, not easy, but true or false It's quicker. Children or patients or clients should never be used as interpreters under any circumstances. What do you all think? True or false? Children or patients or clients should never be used as interpreters under any circumstances. So I'm going to move forward for sake of time. So this one, I would actually say that it's probably false. It's a little bit of a trick question. It's intentionally vague, right? What if the adult, what if the children of these patients or clients are adults, right? Or what if it's a crisis situation and you just need the the client, uh, uh, the children of the client to provide some very basic information to get the, 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 the client to the next step of, of um, an appointment, right? So I would say that never say never, but in general, if possible, right? We should also make sure that the language assistance we provide is competent. And that includes not using untrained individuals, such as family members and or minors as interpreters. As a, as a good practice, we should avoid that whenever possible, right? Um, standard eight. Oh, I'm sorry. There's also some tips about how to work with interpreters. I think that often can be challenging, especially in behavioral health care. But some tips are like looking at the client, not the interpreter, and beware of cultural differences and dynamics between the client and the interpreter. Um, you know, as, as a professional, it's our job to make sure that the client understands. So often it can be helpful to have the client repeat back what they've heard for verification. Center eight just says that materials you provide should be um, uh, easy to understand and translated available in languages that are commonly used, such as multilingual brochures, okay? So um, I'm gonna move forward uh, to the last standard, but some of the reflection questions for this section are, how are interpretation services provided at your organization, if at all? Are there resources in your community that you're using or language brokers you're connected with? Are your signs and materials translated and not just um, translated in different languages, but are they available in other formats, right? For people who have different communication needs. So the last standard, I mean, I'm sorry, the last theme has the most standards. So, but also I tend to go through this a little faster, okay? Engagement, improvement, and accountability. So standard nine says that the organization should establish class-related goals, policies, and accountability, and infuse this through the organization's planning and operations. Standard 10 says that there should be ongoing assessments. Does the organization continually assess how well it's implementing its class, um, its meeting class standards? And how well are they meeting their own class-related goals and, 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 you know, stand, and measures? So there are some tools that we provided in our toolkit. For example, the um, National Center for Cultural Competency has a free organizational assessment and a guide so that organizations can use this on a regular basis to assess areas that they might need to improve and where their strengths lie. Standard 12 says that we should continually assess community health needs so that we could use that data to plan, implement, and pivot our service as needed. So an example, I'll share an example after this. 
And we should also continually collect and maintain accurate demographic data of our clients and communities so that we could evaluate how impactful our class um, activities have been um, in, in changing the landscape of the people that we've ser we're have we serving. So Nikos continually conducts community needs assessments to capture the health needs and trends of the community. And a lot of this, these, this data help us to uh, inform program development. Standard 13 says that we should have community partnerships to co-design, implement, and evaluate policies. Um, and, and ensure cultural and linguistic appropriateness. So there, there's also a uh, spectrum of um, how we could engage the community that is in your toolkit as well. So there are links that are available as well. On one end, it could be just as simple as providing outreach and information to the community, but on the uh, more uh, involved um on the higher end of the spectrum is really building stakeholder decision-making into uh, your programming, right? It's, it's co-decision-making. Um, co so, uh, oops, I'm gonna wrap up for sake of time. Um, so this is the very end. I want to congratulate our all, everyone who has participated and, and great job for those who got the podium spots. You all did great. If this was an in-person class, we would be giving out prizes. Stand oh, I'm sorry, there's standard 14 and 15. I don't know how that came, came out so early. Standard 14, conflict resolution processes, that there should be ways for clients to uh, be able to um, address their grievances and conflicts in a culturally and linguistically appropriate manner. If you do have those policies, some questions to ask is, are some groups using it while others are not? And why are some groups not using it? Is it because they love your service and are completely happy? Or is it because they don't know about it? They're scared to use the system for fear of repercussions, or they just don't know about it or know how to access it. And standard 15 is the last one. It's about how do we engage with the community at large? How are you promoting yourself and also sharing your organization's successes with your stakeholders and constituents? So newsletters and social media could be good ways for us to use that. Okay. So last one, self-assessment. How is your organization currently getting clients to provide honest feedback? Is your organization currently getting feedback from the community at large also? And how is the feedback being used? So um, I know time is short and we didn't, we didn't have a whole lot of time, but I did want to uh, share some concluding thoughts that, you know, we don't obviously need to know everything. It's impossible to know everything. And I think just as important as learning new materials is just as important to unlearn things that we previously thought were true. And I think we re I re really like this reminder about learning for care. Learning because we care. Learning because we know that it would improve how we provide service to the community, not just out of curiosity. And we it's okay, be open to make mistakes, and but be accountable to own up to those mistakes. But also remember to celebrate successes when we do do well. We can't all be experts. I don't consider myself an expert because learning is not transactional. We don't just add on, um, you know, it's not a, a competency exam, but rather it should be transformational. It should be lifelong. Um, we do have these resources again in our toolkit and uh, that, QR code goes to our resource list. Um, and I'm sure Allison will share that again, which she shared at the very beginning. I'll share my email in the chat as well. I know we just have several minutes remaining. I want to make sure that uh, Dr. Wang Lao can get you some of the comments or questions as well. Um, thank you so much. And I'll stop sharing now. Okay. Um, thank you. Allison, we have a comment that the survey link is not working oh is that for the for the one for the ohana center so i will need to get that um going so um i will um finish out by um sharing 
first of all, thanking uh, Michael for a wonderful presentation. I know that you were really crunched for time. Perhaps we would need to invite you back uh, for a deep dive on some of these uh, class standards, but really appreciate, I think it was a really great overview and appreciate your experience. So thank you so much for your expertise and for generously sharing that um, with our community. Um, I want to um, let everyone know that, of course, to remind everyone that um, about our website and our resources. This webinar is one of the many that are um, that are archived. Um, so we have close to about uh, 20 webinars that are archived on our website, on our YouTube channel. So you can go um, to our website um, for the Ohana Center of Excellence. Um, and then um, you can join us on social media. So um, if you follow us on any of these uh, social media platforms. Um, we have links to a lot of our uh, webinars and resources and events that we have. Um, if you're interested in becoming a member uh, or participating in a regional steering committee, um, just as Michael had mentioned that it's really important to understand your region. Um, you know, we I, I'm here in the Bay Area um, as well as Michael, but there are other parts of the country and, and they're very, very different uh, political and historical context in which people live, Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders. So if you're interested, please contact us. Um, we also um, have uh, have a, a QR code here that you can scan so that you can um, be a, a member of our, of our uh, group and we can distribute emails and newsletters to you. Um, so you can sign up for that. And then um, here is our post-event survey. Really appreciate if you can take that survey so that we can collect that data um, for um, the, the webinar as well as for our um, activity. So I'm gonna stop the share um, and I'm looking in the chat. I don't, in the Q and A, I don't see any um, questions that have been submitted. I know that we're at time and some of you may need to go, um, but any last words from you, Michael, thank you for your wisdom and really appreciate um, your willingness to share your toolkits as well as information. It's really nice when people can walk away with usable resources that they can refer to later. So thank you. Yes, thank you for having us. And I put my email in the chat. Happy to connect with anyone, especially if you're from the Bay Area. We can provide some of these tailored services uh, cost free. Um, so be happy to connect with folks who are interested to learn more. Great. Thank you very much. And that concludes our, our webinar. Thank you.